Hi, I'm Chris Whaley, co-author of Mr. President, author of The Mass Saint. Love for you to go to our website, which is mrpresidentbook.com. And you're watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. It is the best. Hi there, this is Mike McClaskey, co-writer of Mr. President. You can find it at mrpresidentbook.com. We'd love for you to buy it. We'd love for you to give us some feedback. You can reach out to us. Our web addresses, our phone numbers are on there. We'd love to hear from you. And you're watching and listening to us on Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by not one, but two very talented individuals from the professional wrestling scene, now turned author and screenplay writers. We're joined by an amazing duo that Rena Friedman Watts put me onto because, you know, she's awesome and has wonderful guests on her show she said kurt get these two on the show and here they are we're joined by the ever talented dr chris whaley and of course mike mccloskey how are you both doing today doing great yay you know if i was any better i'd have to wipe some of it off <laughs> i thought i asked you to introduce me as handsome mike mccloskey did you not get that I'll edit it in post. Oh, okay. Good. <laughs> That'll work. <laughs> For those that don't know anything about yourselves as creative people, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking today. Mike McClaskey. Uh, Chris and I met in the late 70s. Uh, we both had a love for professional wrestling. We both entered the ranks of professional wrestling in the late 70s, and our friendship uh, has continued. I was fortunate enough to do some movies because Florida, at one point in time, I'm going to say the mid to late 80s, Florida was number three. Uh, it was uh, California, New York, and Florida. Uh, so I got in to do some movies uh, and television. I was actually on Hulk Hogan's first television show, which when I tell people that, they say, Hogan knows best. I said, no, he did a uh, one year. He did. It was kind of like a Knight Rider thing, but it was with a boat. It was horrible, but I, I did a, a, a show of that with him. I got my Screen Actors Guild card, and I started writing. Interestingly enough, one of the first things that I wrote was a commercial for the Macho Man. Randy had actually called me one night and said he wanted to get into acting. I said, well, you, you kind of need uh, to start slow, uh, you know, do some commercials, make sure you really like it, and then you can go from there. So I wrote a commercial for him and sent it to the owner of a chicken chain. And again, this was in the 80s, yeah. uh, prior to a lot of email and, and, and anything else, social media. So I, I mailed him this script with some pictures of Randy. A week later, my phone rings and it's the owner of the chicken chain. Uh, I think they were out of uh, Nebraska or Minnesota. And he was a little stern. He said, uh, you know, who, who wrote this? And I said, well, I, I wrote it, but... I didn't write the commercial. I wrote it to, to sell Randy on you. And he says, I love it. He says, I've got a whole team of advertising people and they've never done anything like this. Long story short, we ended up not filming the commercial, but it kind of got Randy. Of course, he ended up doing uh, Slim Jims yeah. and then some movies. But that was a reinforcement for me where I wasn't even writing this thing as a writer. I was writing this thing to try and sell someone. And again, it was a little bit of a reinforcement for me that maybe I can do this. And I started writing some television and I started writing some screenplays. And all along the while, Chris is there with me, bouncing ideas off me. One of the cute stories I love to tell when I talk about how we were co-writers, he called me one Saturday afternoon. I was I had just gotten done mowing the yard. And this is very simple. He says, you know how there's all these stories about a white family adopting a black kid? I said, oh, yeah, yeah. He says, well, what if a black family adopted a white kid, period? So then I took it and, and wrote a 100-page screenplay on that. So that's how we work together. He's very much an idea guy, and, and he'll throw things at me. I'll bounce stuff off of him all the time. And this Mr. President uh, started out as a screenplay, I want to say, in the late 80s. And we ran it by Hulk Hogan and let it sit for a long time. And then Chris uh, had his movie out. Chris contacted me and said, hey, let's let's dust that thing off. 
you know, and we rewrote it kind of uh, for The Rock, presented it to them, and nothing really happened. And and now we have it out in book form. I'm also a, an electrical contractor. That's what I do by day. And then I put on the cape at night and, uh, and type. Married, uh, got kids and grandkids. Wife and I have a nice place here in Florida and a small place up in Georgia that we pop in on uh, every once in a while. And that's about it in a nutshell. How, how about you, Chris? Well, Mike and I got into wrestling in 1978. I wrestled from 1978 to 1988. My last three years in wrestling was when I was going to seminary in Fort Worth, Texas. I am a pastor. Uh, wrestling was my dream. Uh, ministry is my calling. I've been a pastor since uh, 1988. I was a senior pastor in three churches. Last eight years, I, I was on staff at uh, First Baptist Church of Orlando, which here we call it Baptist World. You know, we have uh, Sea World, we have Disney World, uh, Baptist World. First, First Orlando has over 20,000 members, so it's huge. And I got to serve there. When I got out of wrestling, uh, went to my first church. Nobody trains you to be a pastor. I mean, you learn all this stuff in seminary. Uh, I went to seminary for three years. And um, uh, you take, you know, languages, Hebrew, Greek, because the New Testament was written in Greek. Old Testament was written in Hebrew. You take church history. You take education, all that kind of stuff. But nobody teaches you how to be a pastor. And so I, I went to my first church. I'm dealing with some people that are being uh, treated very badly. I had a, a young lady in my church uh, who would, she was always the last one to come in and she would be the first one to leave. Mm -hmm. She would drop her kids off at our uh, children's program and then she would come into the sanctuary and then she'd leave very quickly. One Sunday she came in, she was wearing sunglasses. And I thought that was a little unusual. And uh, after the service, I always stood at the front of the door and shook hands with people. And on that day, she was the last one to leave. And she came up to me. She took my hand with both of her hands, had her head down, and I could see tears uh, dropping underneath her sunglasses. And I lifted her sunglasses, and uh, she had two black eyes. And I thought, you know, any guy that would hit a girl is a dirt bag. Uh, and I asked her, I said, did your husband do this? And she said, yes. And I said, I'm going to go see this guy. And she was like, uh, oh, please don't, he'll hurt you. And I was like, I, I really <laughs> am not worried about that. And so I went to his house and uh, uh, I told him what I thought of, about him hitting his wife and, and how could he do that to the mother of his, you know, precious children. And so I, I said, you know, I came here to see how you do against somebody who was able to fight back because you're obviously a bully and bullies only pick on people that they know they can beat up. So, you know, here I am and let's give it your best shot. And we we got to dance in his front yard a little bit and, and I relieved a lot of my stress and it, was, it felt great. And then I just started having incident after incident where I handled things more as a professional wrestler than I did as a pastor. And I thought, you know, this would, this would make a great TV series. I wrote the book hoping that it would be made into a TV series. I even got a, uh, I got a call from a guy uh, by the name of Kim Dawson. Mm -hmm. uh, Kim was the executive producer of the first three Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle nice. movies. Yeah. They were blockbusters. Yeah. Uh, then he did a movie with Jim Caviezel called Stroke of Genius, the Bobby Jones story. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then he did a faith-based movie called Letters to God. And so he got a hold of my book and called me in, and uh, he was very interested. Uh, and they had a script written. He kept me on the line for about a, a year, and then all of a sudden he changed his mind. But during that time, I got to know a lot of people in the movie business and script writers, and uh, I had a, a, a producer fly down from Canada and met me at Disney World. Eventually, he is the one who produced uh, the movie, The Masked Saint. And uh, the movie came out in uh, January of 2016, Best Picture at the 2015 uh, International Christian Film Festival. You know, after it was in the theaters, it was on Netflix for three years, and now it's running 
on Amazon Prime. It's done better on on uh, Netflix and Amazon Prime than anything. And so uh, Mike and I just continue to have the creative juices and uh, we're both excited about uh, Mr. President. Yeah. I mean, you know, how, how can you not be excited about a professional wrestler becoming the president of the United States? <laughs> You both touched on great, great points that we're going to dive into some questions here as well. What is the misconception about wrestling and screenplay and being an author that people who don't follow those genres misunderstand? I'll let Mike go first. Oh, thanks a lot. Throw me, throw me in front of the bus. <laughs> Unfortunately, a lot of the misconceptions about wrestlers are, are actually true. Wrestling is a, is a, incredibly hard life not the ring portion of it the ring portion of it is the easy part of the wrestling life and i i would have to say if there's a misconception that's it we wrote another um actually a, a tv uh, series about wrestling in the 70s and 80s in florida and uh very little of it has to do with in the ring wrestling and, and i had someone read it and they said there's not much wrestling in here and i said that's the point the point of it is, if, if you're a professional wrestler, very little of your life is actually in the ring. When we were doing TV, TV's three minutes. Yeah. So out of a 24-hour day, if I'm saying you to you that I'm a professional wrestler, guess what? That's only three minutes of my day. So the misconception is, is that you have this incredible professional wrestling life when you really don't. Your professional wrestling life is, is here. It's that it's that small window when you're in the ring. It's what happens out there that the, the misconception is. I'm not going to speak for Chris, but but I never actually made it. I mean, I was on TV. I was with the WWF, the you know the uh, Florida Championship Wrestling, and I'm glad I never made it because I really feel that I wouldn't be sitting here today if I had made it because uh, the toll it takes on you and the, the the things that are required of you. Again, not so much in the ring, that little window in the ring, but it's the 23 and a half hours that proceeds up to it and after it, uh, that that to me would be the misconception of what a professional wrestler's life is other than what you see on that brief window when you watch them on TV or watch them live at the arena. Yes. Um, as far as screenwriting goes, I would think that the misconception would be that it's glamorous. <laughs> Kurt, you probably know from your interaction yeah. with uh, the entertainment business. Um, it's not. Chris and I could never leave these chairs and, and have something that uh, uh, millions of people see. There's nothing glamorous about it. But, you know, somebody may say, oh, well, you're a screenwriter. That must be glamorous. No, I take out the garbage every morning. I, <laughs> you know, walk the dog. Nothing, nothing glamorous about it. I'm sure that there are glamorous screenwriters misconception for me would be that it's a glamorous you know you must live the life no we don't live the life we we live our life chris why don't you throw in here now and another misconception in this day and age there are probably hundreds of wrestling organizations that are independent in our day you had 26 territories across the united states and the independents were highly looked down on Matter of fact, if they found out that you had worked independent, they wouldn't even give you a second thought. It's just like night and day now. Plus, in our day, you protected the business. You know, we had a word, kayfabe. That meant you're not going to smarten somebody else up who doesn't know about the business. But then that was squashed by uh, Vince McMahon. You know, Vince McMahon uh, told the world that it was a work after... You had, you know, 100 years of people protecting the business. Vince McMahon killed it in one shot. But even with that, you know, even though it's a work, it is still brutal on your body. I know Mike's had, to, I mean, I look at me, I've, I've crushed my ankle. I've had five knee surgeries. I've dislocated my hips. I broke pelvis. I broke all my ribs, my sternum, both collarbones. I've had both shoulders surgically repaired, broke my nose so many times I can't breathe out of it, deaf in this ear from getting hit in the ear and and then multiple concussions. And and I love it when I go to a book signing or when I go to speak at a church and people come up and say, uh, that professional wrestling's all fake. 
<laughs> and I say, well, somebody forgot to tell me. And I know Mike had his share of, he had a tremendous bout with gout, I know, in the elbow. And uh, he he's had his own. So that that's a, a, a misconception. And, and also, you know, uh, the misconception about writing is a lot of people don't realize people that in, in professional wrestling that do things, you know, like me being a minister, Mike being a uh, electrical contractor. There was an opera star who was also a big wrestler. We have a mutual friend who is a dentist. He's a dentist by day and a wrestler by night. His motto is he knocks teeth out at night and puts them back in in the daytime. AEW, their female star, I think her name is Britt Baker. Uh, she is also a dentist. So you have people from all kinds of backgrounds who are closet wrestling fans and people who get into wrestling uh, from, you know, various backgrounds. Talking about obviously Mr. President, which looks like an amazing book. As wrestlers, you both know how to work a good story in the squared circle and as writers as well, too. What makes a good story in the ring and how does that translate into writing a political comedy with equal stakes in Mr. President? Well, we live in probably the craziest world that I have known in my many years of existence on this earth. I never thought that I would see Washington become uh, what it has become. You know, if you look at these uh, politicians before they get into politics, you know, they're just normal people like us. And in a couple of years after politics, they're multimillionaires. There's so much corruption in Washington, our thought was, wouldn't it be great to have somebody who was different? And of course, uh, Butch Vernon is way different as a professional wrestler, uh, never even thinking about the presidency, he gets conned into signing an autograph to a sleazy comedian who didn't know he's signing an agreement to be his vice presidential candidate. <laughs> ends up being the president of the United States and then putting his wrestling buddies in his cabinet and turning Washington upside down. I think that is a story that 99% of the people in the United States would love to see because they're sick of what the political corruption in our country has become. That's just my thoughts. Mike, you might have a different view. Like Kurt said, related back to wrestling, the simple breakdown of professional wrestling is you want to hate one guy and you want to love one guy. Now, Chris and I worked together and we worked against each other again for 20 years. Chris was the mass saint, a, a good guy. I mean, there's no, he had a red cross on his, uh, on his cape and I was the evil Prince Ananka. It's right in my name, evil. I'm, I'm, I'm a bad guy. So that's the, the basis of a professional wrestling match is, one guy's good, one guy's bad. Good versus evil. In our book, we almost have that where uh, Timmy, our comedian, is almost a bad guy. Uh, someone that you you could not like. Butch, the professional wrestler, is a good guy. Kisses babies, goes out of his way to help people. So even though they are together, it's almost a good versus evil because one wants to do a little bit of of bad and the other one wants to do a little bit of good i love remembering back when chris came to me one day and said i want to be the bad guy and i said you can't you walk out to the ring with a white wearing all white with a red cross on your back i walk out to the ring wearing all black you you can't be the bad guy i'm sorry chris we kind of wrote it in the idea that like professional wrestling you have a good guy that the people will love and you have a bad guy that the people could possibly hate. Now, with that said, a lot of bad guys end up being loved. Stone Cold Steve Austin started out as a bad guy. People loved him. The Rock started out as a bad guy. People loved him. I'll go back. Uh, Dusty Rhodes started out as a bad guy. People loved him. So it, it's nothing to have a character that you're going to say, we want you to be bad, but we're going to turn you good, which is kind of what we do with, with Timmy in this thing. That's what I find interesting is there's so much great storytelling and being authors and being of an older generation, 
you have a lot of stories to tell and the fact that you're working so well together in this collaborative effort is just wonderful to see because I think it's a testament to not only in the ring but outside of the ring you you talk about your lives outside of it and you talk about your other passions as well too in your other jobs from that collaborative aspect Mike, what does Chris bring to the table from a writing perspective and creative perspective? And Chris, what does Mike bring to the table from the same perspective? Pretty much just what I told you. Bad guy, good guy. <laughs> I'm bad. I am all over the place. I'm scatterbrained. I, I'm not going to say that I have evil thoughts, but I play that character very well. Chris is the good guy. Chris is grounded. Chris is stable. So it's, it is the, the perfect, I can be good, but I can also be very bad. We have that great balance. The original uh, Mr. President was actually an R-rated script. So what do you think Chris says? Yeah, we can't, we can't do that. Let's tone it down because he's the good guy. Let's tone it down. So we got rid of this. We got rid of that. We, you know, we toned this down. We toned that down, which I loved because I'm the bad guy. So I, I think that's the perfect mix, jumping back a step. So when Chris and I would wrestle against each other, which we usually knew weeks in advance, I would literally write down our match, uh, 20 minutes, and I would write it down. And then we would go over it uh, over the phone. We would go over it when we got there. When you talk about writing, that's my, that's my core. I have to have something written down. And, and we would talk about it. We would go over. He'd say, I'd rather not do this spot here. Let's do it there. And I'd, I'd scratch it out. We'd move it down there. And we'd have it all written down so that we could rehearse it, so that we can talk it through. And it's like, okay, now we're ready to go out to the ring and perform it. I love comedy. Uh, matter of fact, I do Christian comedy in churches and for banquets and corporate organizations and things like that. Just like uh, Mike was saying, you know, Mike is, he is so funny. I, I'm, I'm funny. I love to do comedy, but the comedy that I do is things that I've heard other people do and I just make it my own. Mike is one of the most creative, one of the funniest people that I have ever met in my entire life. His comedy is so uh, off the cuff and and so we just we make a good combination because uh, I love I love humor and you cannot be around uh, Mike McClaskey without laughing because he's one of the funniest guys that I know. We're just a good mix uh, when it comes to to humor. And by the way, he does one of the best Bill Murray's that you'd ever want to see. I mean, oh. Bill Murray is one of my favorites. Yeah. Uh, you know, Groundhog Day yep, and so yeah. forth, and uh, uh, Cinderella Golfer. Mike. It's in the hole. Yeah. It's in the hole. Yeah. It's in the hole. <laughs> yeah. It's in the hole. Yeah. <laughs> so we we just really play off of each other, and uh, we I mean, we both like humor, but the core of the humor comes from Mike. How does humor contribute to a deeper understanding in Mr. President of political responsibility? We have a line in there that I think is very prevalent to today's environment. And the line goes something along the lines of, I think they're interviewing a woman after she leaves the poll and they say, what do you think? And she says, if this political race is going to be a comedy, then I'm going to vote for the comedian. And that's kind of our take on, on of course, of, on what's going on. It is so, so bad that it's funny. I sit back and laugh. You know, I sit back and laugh at everything. Like Chris said, I can find humor in pretty much everything, which is a little bit of a dark side on me, but that's all right. You know, when you look at this and you say that person is such a, pardon the expression, such a screw up that it's comical. And that's kind of the way we approach this is that if you're going to make a comedy out of this, then I'm going to go ahead and vote for the comedian. How's that? <laughs> yeah. I think that the big sell for Mr. President is the fact that it's not just a, a political story. It is a political comedy. That's what it is. It comes so natural for Timmy Connors. He had the bad home life. And each step that Timmy makes is a step upward in the world of comedy. And each step that he makes, he gets funnier and funnier. I think that 
that's a big sell today because I think people are tired of being sad. <laughs> people are tired of being, you know, depressed. They want something that's going to make them laugh. And also the, you know, there is the possibility of reality in this thing. I mean, The Rock has talked about running for president. You know, he missed a, a, a big opportunity mm -hmm. by not taking, you know, Mr. President and making it his own. I just think that a lot of people are looking for something to laugh at and laugh with, and that's what they'll get with Mr. President. You know, I was going to ask about, and you both have talked about the fact that I could see this as a series. I could see this as a, as a film, whether it's a feature or a short, you're like, eventually I, I, eventually I think that this could, this should be like on Netflix and on um, Amazon prime and all those streaming services, because it's, it's too good to pass up. You both have the knowledge. You both have a great novel and series. I'm sure Mike already has the script already prepped and ready and dusted off every so often. So, you know, I say keep pushing that angle and I'll be in the front row with the popcorn and the 3D glasses, you know, let's let's get it going. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's a great opportunity. Um, the the possibilities of, of the WWE taking this is not as good as <laughs> perhaps AEW. AEW is up and coming and they're, I mean, they're blowing it out of the water. You know, they're, they're, they've got sellout crowds and they've got great, great reviews on TBS and TNT where their uh, live shows are, are shown on Wednesday and on Sunday nights. An organization like that could take this and make it something, you know, what really made the WWE? It was a movie called Rocky Three. Oh, yeah. Because Hulk Hogan had his first appearance on the big screen in Rocky Three, And of course, that was the height of his career. He was probably over 300 pounds and really juiced up. Yeah. Uh, but after that, man, everybody wanted to watch the WWF because that's where Hulk Hogan was. The AEW could take this and make their champion the champion and use all AEW wrestlers and make it their own. So it, it's really open for any big wrestling organization that wants to uh, take the next step because, you know, movies are what drive people to things. And this is going to be a great movie one day. That's what I find interesting. You're you're developing characters from start to finish. You're both working together collaboratively here. When both characters were created for this series, when you started the concept to its finished product, what did you learn from the characters and what did you learn from yourselves? Well, I learned that everybody wants to laugh. I've said that before, but I'll say it again. Everybody wants to laugh and have a good time. You can't be around uh, Mike without laughing. And so I, I actually, he doesn't, I'm sure, but I actually see a lot of Mike and Timmy. And I think that's why it was so easy for Mike to write, you know, about Timmy, because, you know, that that's him. Butch you know, is easy to write because he's a good guy and that's what I portrayed. And so, you know, we just both worked uh, off of each other to, to come up with that. Just so you know, um, and I don't know that you're familiar with this name, uh, Pat Paulson was a comedian in the 60s and 70s who used to run for president every four years. Okay. A very deadpan uh, I don't know how Chris, how what are the term to use to describe him? Very uh, vanilla, very bland. But he was on uh, Johnny Carson Tonight Show. He was on uh, Rowan and Martin Laughing. We just saw him on a rerun of Carol Burnett the other night. <laughs> he would legitimately uh, pretend run for president every four years. They had bumper stickers. They had T-shirts. People would put signs in their yard. Pat Paulson for president. That's kind of where uh, I started this whole thing. Again, that was the 60s and 70s. But then I said, well, what if uh, you bring it forward to where we have uh, the Internet, where we have the social media and you have a comedian that decides he wants to do that? Again, the, the purpose of Timmy running for president every four years is to line his pockets mm -hmm. because he wants people coming in to see him, his comedy act. Um And again, that kind of turns on him in a, in a positive way, which which kind of throws him for a loop. But um, 
and that was kind of the, the the basis of this where where I originated the the character for that. And then uh, oddly enough, we did originally write this uh, for Hulk Hogan, presented it to him, heard nothing. And then six months later, he was on the Jay Leno Tonight Show announcing he was going to run for president. No, no correlation there. You know, couldn't have had anything to do with it. And then again, fast forward years later, we rewrote it for Dwayne The Rock Johnson. We handed the script to his dad at a luncheon and, uh, and said, you know, we think this is funny. We think Dwayne would be perfect in it. He has a production company. And then sure enough, you know, six, seven, eight months later, uh, Dwayne's on the cover of People magazine saying he might run for president. No correlation. No, uh, you know, no, nothing. It's where you you drop a hook and, and people are biting on it. Hulk bit on it. Uh, the Rock bit on it. So the concept of what we've written is a is like Chris said, it's a real concept. Um, if I was to say to you, uh, we're going to have a non-political person run for the office and he's going to win, would you say that'll never happen? Uh, yeah, 99% of the time. Oh, well, I'll introduce you to Donald Trump. <laughs> You know, so to say that a non-political person can't win the uh, presidency, no, that can happen. So for us to say we have a comedian who's non-political uh, running for president, yeah, it, it could happen. Is there anything I haven't touched on you'd like me to ask you both? Well, I think Chris and I both kind of touched on it a little bit. We're normal people. We're right next door. We never want anyone to think that we have our email address and our personal cell phone numbers on our website. That should tell you something. One of the hardest things about, I think Chris will agree with me, one of the hardest things about writing is getting someone to acknowledge you, some, getting someone to answer an email, getting someone to look at something, primarily because there's no contact information. We're just the opposite. You want to contact us, you want to call us, you want to email us. Hey, go right ahead. We're we're right next door. You want to come knock on my front door? Just don't do it after ten o'clock at night. You know. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know he stole my thunder on that because I agree with everything he said. You know because we do have our our personal email address uh, and our personal you know cell phone numbers on mrpresidentbook.com. I want people to know that there are actually people out there who will respond to them if they've got questions. I wrote a, a book without Mike. Uh, he he did write a script for it. Uh, I got in touch with my feminine side. I wrote a Christmas book. You know, mm -hmm. my wife and I, we love those stupid Hallmark movies <laughs> and uh, we watch them every year. And I thought, you know, once you write a book and it's made into a movie, then you start thinking, what can I write that'll be made into another movie? And of course, Christmas movies are very popular. And I wanted to uh, get Danica McKellar oh. to look at this because I think it would really be a great movie for her. Yeah. So I've gone on Facebook trying to contact her and I get these responses and I know it's coming from her publicist. And she says, send me a, a, a Facebook request and uh, text me or whatever. And I respond, how in the world do I do that? Because you're a popular figure. You don't have a regular Facebook account. So how can I do that? There's no way to respond to her. And I've gone on IMDB Pro to get her manager's email address and all of that, but you get no response whatsoever. With Mike and with Chris, you got questions, you get a response. May not be that day, but it'll be the next day or the day after. You'll always get a response from it. The personal connection in this fast-paced world these days is is disheartening in to a certain extent because uh, I'm 44 so I'm I'm not that young uh but I think it comes back to I used to go downtown with my friends we used to connect and talk and go to movies and play pool and you know I talked to a friend of mine more recently and he's like yeah his son and doesn't want to leave his his computer his bedroom or whatever it's just like you know uh, technology and times have changed but I I think these types of interviews help reconnect people. I think that you're both very personable people as well, both uh, Chris, yourself and Mike. And this conversation we're having is hopefully going to open eyes to an amazing series with not only Mr. President, but with everything else that you create in the past and in the future. Yeah. 
Hey, hey Chris, should ahead. I should I tell them the the joke about uh, our 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 standard line when we hand someone a script? What sure. we say to them? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so um, Kurt, uh, we have a standard line, and we've we've handed out numerous scripts, not just this one, uh, to numerous people. And the line is, um, can you tell me when you leave here, which door are you are you going out? And they usually look at us kind of puzzled. And they go, what do you mean? I go, well, are you going out the front door or are you going out the side door or are you going out the back door? And I go, well, why do you want to know? And I said, well, because we want to know which garbage can we can pull the script out of once you walk out. Now, with that said, when we handed Dwayne Johnson's father, Rocky Johnson, the script, he was with a, uh, he, he had a publicist uh, whose name is slipping me right now. Um, and I saw the publicist a year later, and guess what the publicist told me uh, Rocky Johnson did with our script when he left the, the place? Hopefully read it. No, he put it straight into the garbage can. The publicist pulled it out, read it, and then went to Rocky and said, you need to read this. This is good. So I say that jokingly. I say, which door are you going to be leaving? Because we want to know which garbage can to go look at. I say that as a joke, but that's the reality of this business. If I, if Chris or I hand someone something at an event, it's pretty much guaranteed that as soon as they walk out that door, they're going to just drop it right into the first garbage can that they see, which to me is disrespectful, yeah. you know? Well, I think, Kurt, you probably got an unbelievable audience that follows you. And when they follow you, they enjoy what you what you give them. So the same thing with uh, with Mike and I, what we portray to people is is something that your audience can say, hey, you know what? I, I can do this. I, I can do something that's deep in their heart that they want to do. And maybe, you know, Mike and Chris can inspire them to fulfill their dreams because we get turned down all the time. And just because you get turned down doesn't mean that it's the end of the world. You know, you look at the 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 gal who did uh, the Harry Potter, you know, she's a, a billionaire. She was turned down, I don't know how many times before finally somebody, I think she self-published it too. Uh, look at Sylvester Stallone. He was turned down so many times because he wanted to play the part of Rocky. I mean, people wanted to buy a script. People wanted to buy the concept, but they didn't want to buy him, but he never gave up. You're looking at two guys that will never, ever give up. And then I'm sure you have people in your audience that have this desire to do something uh, that perhaps they've said, you know, there's no way I can do it. You're looking at two guys that can tell you, hey, don't give up. Just keep trying. Uh, maybe you'll hit it one day. No truer words have been said, truly. I, I think that's wonderful, great advice. And and I tell a lot of people that come on the show that put themselves down during the show. It's like, no, look, you're here. You're promoting yourself. You're promoting your passion for what you're creating, whatever that may be. And this is just one one interview in thousands you're going to do just to push yourself forward. So I think, yes, I completely agree with with everything that you both have said. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? The guy that inspired me the most is a guy by the name of Dr. Jess Moody. When I went to college, uh, never planned to go to college, I actually went down to college because the young lady I was in love with, who has been my wife for almost 49 years, uh, was going to college. She took me to church and I heard this guy speak, uh, Dr. Jess Moody, and he was just one of the most amazing people that I had ever heard. He also <laughs> was Burt Reynolds' pastor. You know, when I was in college in the 70s, Burt Reynolds was the number one box office draw. And Burt Reynolds was from West Palm Beach, and that's where I went to college. And Jess Moody was the pastor of the First Baptist Church of West Palm Beach. He married uh, Burt Reynolds to Lonnie Anderson. I know that didn't work out, but uh, he was just the closest friend that Burt Reynolds could have. And uh, Dr. Moody was just a, an unbelievable guy. He, he made you feel like a million bucks when you were around him. 
he left uh, West Palm and went to California and was a pastor out there and had a ministry to uh, TV and movie people while he was in California. Matter of fact, uh, Dennis Quaid, uh, the Quaid brothers, Randy and Dennis, were a part of his church out there. Uh, the big tall guy, Magnum, P.I., what's his name? Tom Selleck. Uh, yeah, Tom Selleck was a part of his church and his brother also. And, and a lot of other TV people, uh, Dom DeLuise, uh, a lot of people that were a part of when he was in California. Dr. Moody just had a way of making you feel like a million bucks uh, and he never turned anybody away and he inspired me uh tremendously to to just be kind to everybody you meet and do everything you can for the people that you meet and not expect anything back that's probably the one that's made the biggest impression on my life first i guess i i kind of need to preface this by saying it's very very hard to impress me not that um i'm better than you but chris as an example, Chris impresses me. And if you knew Chris the way that I knew Chris, you would be impressed also. As far as one person, that would obviously have to be my father. I'm 6'1". When I was wrestling, uh, I was 280 pounds. My father was probably 5'5", five, 5'6", five, five, uh, 165 pounds. Non-athletic. Uh, he was a businessman who built everything on his own, was never given anything. He didn't go to college. Uh, he had a, a very rough life. He was sickly, for lack of a better term. Um, I worked for him uh, in his electrical business. So picture uh, a 26-year-old me, uh, again, 6'1", 6'1 and a half, 280 pounds, sitting at a desk that my father paid for with his sweat. And he comes walking into my office and he's standing there looking at me. And I look up and I, I said, I said, yeah, you know, like, what are you looking at? And he looked at me and he says, I'm impressed by you. And I said, really, you're impressed by me? And he says, yes. He says, what, what you have done, what you can do and what you will do. He says, that impresses me, which that almost drove me to tears because here's a man that just meant the world to me and was given nothing, and he was giving me everything, everything, uh, just so that I could move forward. Uh, you know, so again, when, when I meet someone and I think of my father and I meet someone and someone says, well, I've done this and I've done that, and I dig a little deeper and I find out, well, you did it because your parents financed it. And then I say, well, okay, I'm, I'm not really impressed, again, because I go back to my father who did everything on his own and paid for it with his life. And then it's kind of like, okay, so when I'm, I'm around people and they try and impress me and I, I just come off as aloof, sometimes maybe I offend them, but it's kind of like, you've got a real high uh, mark to meet. I'm out of screen there, but but when, when you're trying to impress me, if I could move my hand about another six foot higher, that's the, that's the mark that my father left. So if you're trying to impress me, uh, you better go got, go out to the garage and get a ladder and start climbing up it because you've got a you've got a real high high way to go and and I don't even I pale in comparison to my father. Thank you for asking that. And and I shed some tears for you just just to let you know that. Wow, that that touched good. me actually. That was that's really good because I think I think back to my well m my single mother my my mother that well she's remarried but she raised me as a single parent and so. Yeah, that that touched me. I that's, yeah, that's good. Yeah, when you like like in your instance, you have a very high bar. So when you come across someone else that says, "Well, I'm doing this and I'm doing that," and then you look at what your mother did, mm -hmm. it's kind of like, "Okay, uh, good for you," but you know, it, it it pales in comparison. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, wipe the tears. Come on, <laughs> straighten up here, yeah. Kurt. Well, I knew Mike's dad, and he was an impressive, you know, every time we wrestled, he was there with a the camera. Nice. Every time. And uh, matter of fact, some of the old old videos that we have are from, you know, Mike's dad taking those videos. And Mike knew my dad. My dad had a third grade education. Uh, he was a long distance truck driver. Uh, my mom had a seventh grade education, but yet they were just you know, great people like Mike's mom and dad were just great people. They were thrilled with 
uh, the accomplishments that uh, Mike and I both made. We were very blessed to have them in our life, and we're trying to to do that with our own kids and grandkids. That's good, and and I'm sure you're you're both succeeding very well in that respect. From a professional standpoint, you are both successful not only in the ring, but as screenwriters, as writers, as well as Chris being a pastor and Mike being in, in the electrical business. Professionally, you're successful in that regard. Do you consider yourselves personally successful? That's, um, again, that's a, that's a good question. And that's a, uh, when you go on a scale, the short answer is yes. You wake up in the morning, you put your clothes on and you go do what it is you have to do. The longer version here, I have an older brother who unfortunately is not doing well. My brother and I both ran a business and we filed for bankruptcy on a Friday. I got up Monday morning, put my work clothes on and went to work. He never recovered. Your attitude is what will allow you to say whether you're successful or not. I have a winning, successful attitude. I want to go out and do things. I want to get up in the morning and I want to work. I want to provide for my family. I want to write. I want to do this. I want to do that. When I look at that, I say, then I am successful in having a goal. May not be successful in accomplishing that goal, but I'm successful in having a goal. You hit on it earlier in the conversation of young people that sit and play on their phone all day long or aren't working because they're collecting a check from the government. I don't see that. I don't see that at all. And I don't see how you can consider yourself successful if that's what you're doing. Not so much the the accomplishment of that goal, but having that goal and striving for that goal. Now I'm successful because I have a goal and I'm striving for it. If I ever stop, if I ever, if you ever do this Zoom and you see me on the couch uh, in my pajamas at two in the afternoon, then guess what? You can say, Mike's no longer successful. You know, I shared that neither one of my parents uh, had an education. So education was not pushed in my house. Never planned to go to college, never planned to. But I met this young woman when I was 16 years old that knew what she wanted to do. Like me, she grew up in poverty. And she said, uh, I want to be a high school math teacher. I'm not going to live in poverty the rest of my life. And so uh, that's why I went to college. And then my life changed uh, when I went to college. Uh, that's where I met the Lord, my first uh, semester in college. And I, uh, I became a Christian. My life changed. That's when I started being successful because of that. Um, my wife and I have two, two girls. Uh, our oldest one is the same age as you, Kurt. Uh, 44, and our youngest one is 41. Both of my girls uh, graduated as valedictorians. Nobody in our family, you know, had graduated from high school until I graduated and in college, and then nobody had ever gotten a doctorate. I remember the day I got my uh, doctorate, my dad was there, and after I received my doctorate, my dad came up and put his arm around me, and he said, uh, son, I just want you to remember something about them degrees. That's the way he said it. He said, uh, them degrees are just like another crook in the pig's tail. It doesn't make the ham any better. And so, you know, my dad had a way of keeping me humble. <laughs> but I've often said that if you took everything away from me and all I had was my my wife and my two girls, I would still be a very successful, rich person. That's what I think. You know, I'm very blessed because I have people that, that love me and people that I love back. I have great friends and Mike is more than a friend. He's more like my brother. So I'm just very thankful for any success that I've had, but it, none of it has been because of me. It's been because of other people. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Well, failure is never final until you quit. Failure is not final. You just keep getting back up and you keep keep going. I mean, uh, I'm a little bit different than Mike. I think I can get depressed a lot easier than Mike can. But after I get over that, I'm going to put my work clothes back on and I'm going to get at it again. And I'm not going to take no for an answer. And if they don't like that, I'll find something they do like, and I'll just keep trying. I refuse to fail because tomorrow is an, another day, and 
you got another opportunity for success. We've both been fired before. So you could say you're a failure at that job. Uh, no, because Monday morning, guess what? We're right back doing what we love doing again. When I became a state certified uh, master electrician in the late 80s, my father was still alive, which that's even a cute story because that's supposed to be a four-year process, but he made a couple phone calls, uh, slid me through in about two years. Uh, one of his top supervisors came to me and said, you'll never succeed at this. He's since passed a long time ago, but if he was still alive, I'd pick my phone up and call him and say, hey man, guess what? Guess what I'm still doing? Chris is a lot like me. The best way to, to find out whether I'm going to succeed or not is to challenge me because I'm not going to lose. Even if on the scoreboard I lose, guess what? I'm not going to lose. This is kind of getting off subject, but years ago I went up north to, to visit some family and one of the guys was, was real cocky. And I had never played racquetball before. I had played tennis, but I had never played racquetball before. He said, you want to go play racquetball? And I said, sure. First two games, he completely destroyed me. He basically challenged me. He said, you're horrible at this. You suck at this. You're defeated at this. And he said, you want to do one more game? And guess what? I ended up beating him. The best way to find out whether what I'm made of is to challenge me at something. And I, again, I'm pretty sure Chris is the same way. You want to find out uh, what we're made of, challenge us. Because even though we may not win when the score is done, we will have won because you'll know that you've been in a, in a battle with us. Neither one of us, because neither one of us are going to quit. Fire me on a Friday, guess what? You'll, you'll find me on a Monday doing the same thing for somebody else. I got no problem with that. The younger generation is looking at your works and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a writer, screenwriter, maybe a pastor, maybe something creative in their lives, maybe you've inspired them in some way, shape or form. And the fact that you have the younger generations with you, you're inspiring them either consciously or subconsciously. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Don't stop doing what it is you're doing. Chris hit it on it, hit on it earlier where the younger generation is so social media driven. We have younger people that will say, I applied for a job. And I said, what'd you do? They said, well, I filled out the application online and sent it in. I said, well, did you drive to the company and go knock on their door? No, I didn't do that. Well, why not? Don't quit. Keep doing what you're doing. Chris preaches. I don't preach. But what I do is I tell people, if you look at my life and you think my life is successful, then get behind me and follow my footsteps. And I would say that to young people. Leave your footsteps so that other people walking behind you will want to follow in those footsteps. And of course, I'm not talking about actual footsteps. I'm talking about lifestyle. I'm talking about life choices. I had a, a fellow that works with me, drive with me the other day. And when we were done, at the end of an eight hour shift, he turned to me and he said, is your day always like this? And I said, what do you mean? He said, 100 miles an hour. Now he wasn't talking about my driving, he was talking about me. And I said, yes, it is. My day, I said, actually, today was a little bit on the slow side. Younger people, if you're listening to this, go, do something, leave footsteps so the people that are behind you, the people that are watching you, are impressed and want to follow your footsteps. Like I hope you maybe want to follow my footsteps. With my two girls, when they were growing up, I made an agreement with them. I said, if you make all A's on your report card, I'll give you 50 bucks. If you get five A's and one B, you don't get the 50 bucks. I paid off every report card on both of those girls while they were growing up because I wanted to inspire them. There was one Saturday, my girls came to me and they said, dad, uh, we're bored. I said, come with me. I took them out to the front of the yard and the flower bed. And I said, you see this flower bed? I want you to pull every weed out and put it in this black bag. And when you get through, come in the house and get me. And they just kind of looked at me with what? I said, do it. I went inside and a little while later, they came in, they said, dad, we're through. And I said, come with me. I took them to the side yard. And I said, you see this flower bed? Pull every weed out and put it in this bag. And when you get through, come see me. And they just kind of slumped their shoulders. 
And then they came in and they said, dad, we're through. And I said, come with me. I took them to the garage. I opened the garage door. I said, I want you to take everything out and then sweep it and then put everything back in neat and orderly. And the moral of the story is they never, ever came to me again and <laughs> told me that they were bored. And then when my girl started working, when you go to work, I said, don't just stand around. I said, pick things up and straighten them up and get a broom and sweep. You stay busy while you're working and you'll make a great impression on your boss. Both of my girls, you know, the, the people that they worked for while they were going to college didn't want them to go back to college. They wanted them to stay there because they had such a good work ethic. So young people, if you want to be successful, you have to go the extra mile. And you have to overcome your boredom, get off of your video games and get out and get into the real world. And like Mike said, if you make an application, don't just make the application, go there, call them, irritate them to death until they'll give you a job just to get you off of their back. But don't give up because you didn't get your way one time. You're going to find success by not giving up. If your life was a comic book, film or novel. What would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? Hmm. Well, I guess the, the title... The t <laughs> Thank you for such an easy question to right. point out. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I'm not going to pick uh, a title that I would make. I would say The Count of Monte Cristo. Mm -hmm. I love that movie. Jim Caviezel was awesome in it. I love the story because here's a guy that got screwed by his so-called best friend and ends up in 16 years of complete misery, but ends up being this extraordinary person. That would be my life. I mean, I, I haven't had 16 years, but I have those momentary lapses where I fall into failure, but in the end, uh, I'm going to be like Jim Caviezel and overcome it. If there was a musical soundtrack, it would be that, I can't even think of the name of that, Dancing Dragons or what's the name Imagine of that? Dragons. Imagine Dragons. Imagine Dragons. Yeah, that, that song that they did. And I can't even think of the song, but uh, I'll think of it after we get off. <laughs> that, that would be mine. So I'm going to go in the opposite direction here. Chris hit on it earlier. If I was going to go with the movie, it would be Caddyshack. Yeah. If you haven't seen Caddyshack, a lot of people would, would be upset by that answer. And I'd say, watch the movie, and, and then you understand what goes on in here between the, between the two ears. That's my mind all day long is Caddyshack. Bill Murray, Chevy Chase, Rodney Dangerfield, Ted Knight. That's my mind. My mind is constantly turning, looking for the gopher. That may be the wrong answer for some people, but if you haven't seen the movie, watch it. Then you'll get a little better understanding. The song, Chris hit on the song earlier. Uh, there was a, I want to say he was English uh, songwriter named Anthony Newley years ago. He did Candyman from uh, uh, Willy Wonka. And he also wrote a song that Sammy Davis recorded, which which I love Sammy Davis. I yeah. thought he was the perfect entertainer. It's called uh, Tomorrow is Another Day. Chris hit on that earlier, and the song goes something like this. Uh, Tomorrow is another day, and I shall make my way tomorrow. And you talked about giving up and, and success or failure. Tomorrow is another day. If, if I fail today, guess what? Tomorrow is another day, and I shall make my way tomorrow. Well, Chris and Mike, I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you both so much for coming on the show. Yeah. Got a question for you. Oh, sure. The, the name of this is Two Geeks <laughs> Talking. Uh, I'm looking at you and I'm saying, okay. Who's the other geek? Geek. Where, yeah, where's the other one? Because, uh, Parker, I got news for you. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not taking that, uh, I'm not taking that role. Fine. Three geeks talking. There you go. We're all geeks. Oh, sure. okay. <laughs> Three geeks now talking. I get it. Now I get it. <laughs> all right. All right. Well, hey, if you want to get the book, uh, you go to mrpresidentbook.com and uh, you can order off of there. And also you can correspond with us because our information is there too. Uh, the best way to get the book is on Amazon, but if you go to our, our website, mrpresidentbook.com, all you got to do is just hit on uh, order a copy and it'll take you right to Amazon. 
buy the book, wear the belt. Chris and I both have replica belts. If you buy the book and you're near us, we'll sign the book. We'll let you wear the belt and uh, take your picture with it. Well, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talk. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's T-W-O. Of course, the website's going through a revamp. The YouTube channel is a lot more updated. It is youtube.com forward slash TGT Media. The podcast can be found at twogeekstalking.podbean.com or just search for Two Geeks Talking wherever you get your podcast. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening, watching on Two Geeks Talking. Thank you, Kurt. Oh, thank you both.